Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The two men named as suspects in the Salisbury nerve agent attack have appeared on Russian state television and denied being involved. The men who identified themselves as Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Boshirov dismissed British claims that they were intelligence officers, insisting instead that they work in the fitness industry. They said they'd taken a short break in the UK to visit Salisbury Cathedral. From Moscow, Sarah Rainsford reports. Speaking out for the first time, the two Russians accused of the deadly nerve agent attack in Salisbury. Today, they appeared on pro-Kremlin television to declare their innocence. Our friends have been suggesting for quite a long time that we visit this wonderful city. They do resemble the two men identified by British police, but they deny they're Russian intelligence agents. Asked what they were doing in Salisbury, they came up with this. It's a tourist city. They have a famous cathedral there, Salisbury Cathedral. It's famous throughout Europe and, in fact, throughout the world, I think. It's famous for its 123-meter spire. It's famous for its clock. It's the oldest working clock in the world. The men claim they were so keen to see the sights, they made two trips here in two days. The weather was so bad, they came back. British police believe the first visit was actually a recce for the attack. So did they visit the house where Sergei Skripal and his daughter were poisoned? Maybe we passed it or maybe we didn't. I'd never heard about them before this nightmare started. I'd never heard this name before. I didn't know anything about them. From the very start, the Kremlin has dismissed the accusations coming from London as lies. Officials here have called the whole affair absurd, a soap opera. Now, these two men are being presented as definitive proof of that. However implausible their own story actually sounds. The Skripal survived the poisoning. But Dawn Sturgis died after spraying Novichok from a perfume bottle her boyfriend had found. Police believe that's how the nerve agent was brought to Britain. When you go through customs, they check all your belongings. So if we had anything suspicious, any police officer would have questions. Why would a man have women's perfume in his luggage? Accused by Britain, the men now claim they're worried for their lives. They even demand an apology. But this appearance was controlled, carefully choreographed. The suspects have vanished as suddenly as they appeared for the state TV camera. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Moscow. So the Russians say they were just tourists here for a weekend, staying in East London for two nights. They visited Salisbury twice on Saturday and Sunday for around two hours each time. Well, let's go to Salisbury now because Duncan Kennedy is there for us. Duncan. Yes, Sophie, the two Russians claim they came here to Salisbury to see the famous cathedral here. They claimed they were tourists, but the British government has today described that as ridiculous and said the real reason they came here was to murder Sergei Skripal. We've been trying to piece together their movements during the time they spent here in the city to see if the Russian story stands up. The two Russians agreed they did travel to Salisbury Station on Saturday, March the 3rd, but they say they only spent one hour 46 minutes in the city because it was snowing. The men say they then returned to London, but the police here say that their first visit here to Salisbury was in fact a reconnaissance mission. The next day, Sunday 4th of March, the two men returned to Salisbury, arriving at 11.48. Again, there's no dispute with the British version. But this is where timings become crucial. From the station, they say they visited the cathedral in the city centre. So what were they doing on the outskirts of Salisbury at Wilton Road, close to Sergei Skripal's home? They arrived at this petrol station on Wilton Road at 11.58, even though it's not near any of the monuments they came to see. And crucially, say the police, it's only just a short distance from this petrol station to Sergei Skripal's house, just up there. In fact, it took us just two minutes to walk from that petrol station here to Sergei Skripal's house, 
the Russians say they were never here, and that they only came as tourists to see Salisbury Cathedral. Yet here at the cathedral, there doesn't seem to be any CCTV footage of them to back up their claims. And not only that, just look again at the photographic evidence and the timings in all of this. Remember that we saw they were at the petrol station at 11.58, or their next photographed in the city centre at 13.05, heading towards the train station to leave Salisbury. A total of just one hour and seven minutes. Yet in that one hour and seven minutes, apparently going by foot, the men managed to get into this city centre, visit the cathedral and take a series of photographs. Just over one hour in a city that they've flown all the way from Moscow to see. I don't think any of their interview is plausible. Um, I've watched it a couple of times now. Uh, and I think uh, you know, if I was their defence lawyer, my advice to them would be uh, keep quiet uh, and wait to a trial when your alibi will be tested by our evidence. But with the Russian government denials of any involvement in the nerve agent attack, the chances of a trial in Britain are minimal. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News, in Salisbury. Our security correspondent Gordon Carrera is here and that interview certainly uh, provoked a lot of raised eyebrows. That's right. I think people have to make their own minds up about the credibility, the plausibility of this. But I have to say, speaking to British officials here, their official line is that it's insulting and offensive to the victims, this interview. But actually, I think they're quite relieved, perhaps even pleased with it, because I think their feeling is that set against the CCTV and the evidence that was laid out last week, this will not convince people. It raises more questions than answers. The plausibility of why they came to Salisbury to see the 123-metre uh, spire. The questions about why their movements on the particular day. CCTV showing them going away from tourist sites and towards the Scriphouse house. And then the question of their actual identities themselves. Britain still believes these are pseudonyms for Russian intelligence officers. And it was notable in the interview that they, they don't really go into detail about, for instance, their business or their background. And I think people will start to look and question how strong are their legends in spy parlance, their backstories about who they are. And so I think for those reasons, the view from the British government will certainly be that this interview may have done little good for the Russian case at all. Gordon Carrera, thank you. Russian-sponsored assassins? No, we were just tourists trying to see the Wiltshire sights. So say the two men the UK government has named as suspects in the Salisbury Novichok poison attack. In an interview which at times resembled a scene from a spoof spy film, they claimed they'd decided not to visit Stonehenge because of the snowy weather before catching a flight back to Moscow. Here's our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman. While Vladimir Putin was out east, presiding over the biggest Russian military exercise since the Soviet Union collapsed, Moscow was busy firing verbal salvos of its own, aimed at Britain, in a display just as theatrical and brazenly defiant as this one. Last week, the UK accused these men of being Russian intelligence officers and charged them with attempted murder. Russia denied all knowledge, but today they came in from the cold. The setting they chose was an office inside RT, Russia's state broadcaster overseas. The interviewer said they were very nervous and sweating, that she'd had to give them a glass of cognac to calm them down. And their explanation as to why they visited Salisbury sounded just about as wooden as a Russian doll. What are you doing? Well, friends, we've already invited to visit this beautiful city. Солсбери. Uh, 
If it all sounded lifted from Salisbury's Wikipedia entry, perhaps it was. The famous clock dates back to 1386, but this interview was recorded yesterday, just after Mr. Putin said the men were civilians, not criminals, and should talk. Their alibi, this was a sightseeing trip, defeated by famously bad British weather. But that hardly explains why men using sequentially numbered passports visited Salisbury twice during their brief trip to the UK. Or how 10 minutes after arriving on their second visit, they were caught on CCTV near the Skripal's home. За то время, что вы были в Солсбери, вы подходили к дому Скрипалей? Ну, может быть, мы к нему и подходили. А вы если знаете, где дом Скрипалей? Мы знали, где я он нет, а вы? Я не если знаю, мы знали, где он находится. Может, и проходили мимо, может, и не проходили. Я не знаю, я вообще не слышал до вот этой ситуации, пока не начался вот этот кошмар с нами. What they've tried to say today is that they came as innocent tourists for two days in the middle of winter, uh, in the mid whilst it was snowing, at the same time that a former Russian agent was poisoned. Now, that is an absurd uh, proposition, and it's, it's not just a random coincidence. They're responsible, and uh, if they're so fond of souls, we come back and face justice. They weren't asked why traces of Novichok were found in their East London hotel room. British intelligence experts believe the only ingenious element in this bungled plot was placing the nerve agent in this perfume bottle. The suspects implied you'd have to be gay to carry one of these. Нормальным мужикам с собой возить женские духи это не глупо. Зачем у мужчины у мужчины в багаже лежат женские духи? This afternoon, the government's response was pretty much, pull the other one, it's got bells on. Number 10 called it an insult to the public's intelligence, lies and blatant fabrications. The suspects claimed they weren't Russian agents, just businessmen selling nutritional supplements to bodybuilders. They said they were exhausted by the publicity and now want to be left alone. Which is maybe what Vladimir Putin wants as well out on manoeuvres today, which seem to include thumbing his nose at the UK. After a media event so bizarre, it's maybe best described as obscenely comic, given this city was hit by a chemical attack which left four Britons injured and one woman dead. Jonathan Rugman reporting. Well, the two men say they were impressed with the 123-metre spire of Salisbury's Cathedral. Our correspondent, Porrick O'Brien, is there now. Porrick. Jackie, as Jonathan said in his report, the two Russian suspects claimed that they had come to Salisbury to see the cathedral here behind me. And to be honest, it's hard to listen to those clips in the interview without a certain level of bemusement at least, because this story is surreal, it's bizarre, it's got all the sort of twists and turns of some fictionalised crime thriller. But crime thriller it is not, because of the following plotline. Remember, in March, a father and a daughter, Sergei and Yulia Skripal, almost died because they came in contact with that nerve agent, but they recovered thanks in large part to the staff at the district hospital here in Salisbury. Then remember Sergeant Detective Nick Bailey. He's a husband, he's a father, he was the officer on the scene. He became critically ill uh, off the back of that incident. Thankfully, he also pulled through. Then remember in June, this couple in their 40s, Charlie Rowley and Dawn Sturges, they became violently ill after coming in contact with that container and about eight miles from here uh, became violently sick. Charlie Rowley pulled through, but Dawn Sturges did not. And on the 8th of July, this mother of three passed away. And here's another little detail in the plot line that people may have missed. Dawn Sturge, as it turns out, was quite a spiritual woman in her own way. And whenever she walked uh, close to the cathedral here, she would pop in to light 
a little candle. So that, if you will, is the painful personal plot line behind this story. All right, thanks very much, John. Well, we're joined now by Evgeny Buzinski, a former Lieutenant General who worked in the Russian Ministry of Defence for over 15 years and is now chairman of the PIR Centre, a Moscow-based think tank. Um, General Buzinski, it does seem yes. strange that uh, Novichok uh, traces were found in the hotel room in which these two men were filmed in Bow, London, East London. Well, you see, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, difficult to discuss all these details because, you see, a lot of uh, experts, uh, well, uh, absolute majority of experts uh, in Russia, including uh, professional people who are dealing with uh, chemical weapons, well, uh, they believe, me included, by the way, that uh, this, uh, the whole event is a staged one. It's, a, it's an operation of the British government. Uh, I don't know why, uh, due to internal or external reasons, but there are so many inconsistencies, discrepancies, technically impossible things uh, in all these uh, events or investigation that now to discuss uh, the, the, the traces in the hotel room, the bottle, sealed bottle, by the way, with the... Uh, uh, extremely dangerous uh, nerve uh, agent with the concentration of 98%, uh, uh, which according to the uh, experts uh, may, uh, well, it's, may uh, be uh, such concentrations for hours, not well, days. Uh, uh, weeks. General, yeah. you, you know about our uh, chemical weapons uh, uh, testing facility at Porton Down, and it's respected across yes. the world, including in Russia. And they found that Novichok traces were in the hotel. You can agree to disagree, that's fine. But it seems even more ridiculous that these two guys were on passports with sequential numbers, i.e. the next number to each other. That well, is physically impossible for a couple of old impossible. friends to get hold of. Why it's impossible if they apply together with passports to the Russian immigration, uh, well, authorities. They may be given passports. Me and my wife, we have passports different, only one figure. Only one figure because we applied for our passports simultaneously. It's, it's, it's natural. You see, but you know, uh, the, the, today the Prime Minister May said that it's an insult to the British police. Mm. Uh, it is surely an, an insult. It's surely an insult to uh, two fine Russians, which you're proposing they are, uh, that they were put off going to Stonehenge uh, because of the snow. They're Russians, for God's sake. If you, you lot see, can't live with snow, you must need brain surgery. It's not a snow. It's a. You see, it's that substance up to their knees. Rain and snow. You you think that you believe that Russians? We here. We are just swimming along the streets or going uh, through uh, heavy snow. You are wrong. You are absolutely wrong. Well, you you don't deny the film that that actually depicts them in front of the Skrifels house. I mean, they're in the same neighborhood as the house. I also know that the on the opposite house to the Skrifels house is a camera. Where is the movie or, uh, well, uh, some photos from that camera? Uh, because uh, you, we know that there are uh, half a million cameras in London. You film everything. And it insult to uh, Soviet mil uh, Russian military intelligence, uh, uh, so unprofessional behavior of the alleged uh, intelligence officers. Well, I, I, I'm sorry to have to say, but... It, to us here in Britain, this looks like a Charlie Chaplin spoof. So thank you very much indeed for talking to us about it. But I'm afraid to say nobody here is very persuaded by what you've done. You see, uh, the, the matter is that you don't believe us, we don't believe you. It's the total mistrust between our nations. Well, uh, General, it would be much nicer if your think tank could come up with some ways in which we could be good friends and trust each other. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. Some okay. days we will. Well, we will. Thank you very much for joining us, General. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Well, earlier I spoke to the government's security minister, Ben Wallace, and began by asking him what he thought when he first saw the interview. Well, I think it's really quite sad, and, and it's a slap in the face to the victims. You know, this is a serious matter. These are 
there was an attempted murder on two British citizens and a murder of another individual. Uh, and the course of justice is serious. And I think uh, this interview slightly tries to ridicule it. It makes that it's some sort of game, really. And, and I, I think that's a big regret. It's a big regret for both the Russian state and the, the Russian individuals involved. And um, it's, it's just not very nice, really, I think. I mean, it's pretty humiliating for the British government, isn't it? A citizen killed on British soil by, you say, Russian military agents. And there they are on television claiming they're tourists. I don't think it's humiliating. I think it shows that when a state you know, such as Russia decides it's going to prosecute something and uses the, the weight of the state to do it, a, a country like ours with our values and a liberal, open trading democracy is, of course, vulnerable to uh, those type of states prosecuting such a horrendous offence. And they didn't care. I mean, they used an indiscriminate, very dangerous, internationally illegal weapon to do it. And I think that is it's not about humiliation. I think this is about reminding everyone really how very dangerous the Russian government has become in these type of actions. But I suppose the question is, what can you do about it now? Well, we've issued Interpol notices. We've issued a European arrest warrant. The Crown Prosecution Service thinks we have the evidence to have laid charges for attempted murder against two suspects seen in Salisbury. Uh, and, you know, of course, if they are going to hide in the Russian state and that Russian state is going to break international norms and protect them, then, you know, there isn't a great deal we can do about it in the short term. But in the long term, uh, you know, people travel. Uh, in the long term, I'm sure Russia would like to improve its relations with the West. So I, I suspect that at some stage, justice will catch up with these two. Have you repeated your request to the Russians today, given that they've been on television, these two men? Our request is outstanding. We have an Interpol red notice. We have a European arrest warrant. Um, and uh, the Russian state is, without doubt, clear about what we would like. Given the very real difficulties you've outlined about, in the short term anyway, bringing these men to justice, how hopeful are you that you can get more sanctions from your colleagues in the EU? The EU has sanctioned 150 Russians, going right back to Crimea, who are still under sanction. And those 150 are the leadership uh, of the Russian armed forces. They are some very senior people in the Russian government. Uh, and I'm confident by the response we received from our allies in March when collectively the international community expelled 150 intelligence officers from around the world at an unprecedented scale. Uh, that their determination to push back malign Russian behaviour is as strong today as it was back in March. So and you're hoping for more from the EU summit next week? Well, I'm hoping that eventually Russia will wake up to the existing sanctions uh, that are in place, very significant sanctions going back from the Crimean and the MH17 uh, uh, sh shooting down of a jet. There is a clear path out of it for Russia, and one of those paths would, of course, be, you know, helping us deal with the two people we suspect of this attempted murder. So, sorry, just to clarify, you're saying ho that you're hoping Russia will wake up to the existing sanctions. Is that because you don't think you'll get any more sanctions through the EU? I, I, no, I... No, I, I there is significant sanctions already in, po in place, is my point. 150 people, all all at the heart of the Russian state. Uh, and, you know, therefore, you can't sanction someone twice. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sanction the Russian chief of the general staff twice. But He's is there any sign sanctioned. that they're working? At the moment, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not in charge of the sanction assessment. What I would certainly say is at the moment, you know, the Russian economy is not looking good. Uh, it, it is not in a good state. Remember, it is half the size of the British economy. Uh, and eventually, uh, you know, the people of Russia, who, who I notice have decided that uh, President Putin's pension reforms uh, are not uh, as popular as he hopes, will start to realise and make that connection that, uh, you know, the economy is partly affected by these international sanctions driven out of Russians, the Russian government's behaviour. The Security Minister, Ben Wallace, who we were talking earlier. Just over a week ago, Theresa May identified them as Russian spies intent on assassination in Salisbury. Today, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bozhirov went on a Kremlin-controlled TV station to say they were simply tourists visiting the cathedral city on the advice of friends and for its famous spire. Downing Street said it was nothing but lies and blatant fabrications. What's more, the death of an innocent woman and the injuries sustained by their alleged victims, including a police officer, made their explanation deeply offensive. The Russian men complained that British accusations of espionage and attempted murder had left them in fear of their lives and scared to go out at night. The scoop went to one of the news channels the Kremlin funds 
The Salisbury suspects saying their weekend trip was for tourism and not for an assassination attempt, according to the channel's own translation. You really look like the pictures shown to us by the UK. Who are you? We are those who were shown to you in the pictures, Ruslan Bashirov and Alexander Petrov. Are those your real names? Yes, they are our real names. Just two young men with an interest in the cathedral, they said. And so they crossed a continent to see it. They know all the key facts. What were you doing there? Our friends had been suggesting for a long time that we visit this wonderful town. Salisbury, a wonderful town? Yes. There's the famous Salisbury Cathedral, famous not only in Europe, but in the whole world. It's famous for its 123-meter spire. It's famous for its clock, the one of the first ever created in the world that's still working. They said they cut short their sightseeing trip because of the bad weather in the town. And it certainly was a cold weekend. We naturally were going there to see the Stonehenge, Old Sarum and the cathedral. But it didn't work out because of this uh, slush. The whole city was covered with slush. So you only spent an hour in Salisbury? On March 3rd, yes. That's because it was impossible to get anywhere. What about anywhere. the next day? On March 4th, we went back there because the snow melted in London and it was warm. It was sunny. The British weather had frustrated them. The Muscovites returned home. But there, it was minus 10 degrees and had been snowing heavily. So while you were in Salisbury, did you go anywhere near the Skripal's home? Maybe. We don't know. I don't, you? do you? Do you know where the house is? If we knew where it's located, maybe we did. Well, maybe we did, maybe we didn't. And I'd never heard about them before this nightmare started. And I'd never heard this name before. I didn't know anything about them. And what of the bottle of counterfeit designer perfume, which British prosecutors say was adapted to spray the Novichok? Why would a man have women's perfume in his bag? Even an ordinary person would have such questions. Why would a man need perfume for women? But the British government insists the suspects were sent by Russian intelligence, the GRU, and that Moscow has responded with obfuscation and lies. The security minister says the suspect's story is implausible. GRU headquarters is 11 kilometres northwest of the Kremlin. It would have taken you and I a couple of minutes to go and find them, but uh, they've been trotted out on telly with a cover story that doesn't really match. Uh, and, uh, you know, best if they were kept quiet. And uh, the more they open the mouth, the more they tarnish the GRU's reputation, I suspect. Did he see the future? Or did Putin's request yesterday for the suspects to share their story tell us he's really in control? Today, as he watched military preparations, this verbal conflict continued. British officials believe Moscow's response has been bewildering, but they accept that might have been the point. Rohit Katru, News at 10. And as promised, Romilly Weeks is live in Moscow for us. Romilly, can you shed any light on what Russia's motives are here? Well, it certainly has been a Russian tactic to throw in so much disinformation into this that people get confused about the chain of events and start to find it difficult to separate fact from fiction. But this interview seems to go way beyond that. The cover story is so thin that even the interviewer Margarita Simonian, a woman who has close contacts with the Kremlin, seems to find it hard to hide her surprise at certain points. And there has been a reaction on Russian social media of complete incredulity with comments along the lines of, these are bad actors with a bad script, and why would two Russians be so put off by some snow? It is tempting to see the controlling hand of the Kremlin behind everything here, but it is possible that in the way that this assassination attempt was botched, the, the GRU, Russian military intelligence, rushing to come up with a cover story here, have also just botched the case for the defence. Romilly, thank you. Well, it's a long way from Moscow to Salisbury, but the accusations about a deadly link between them remain, despite the elaborate explanation offered today by Petrov and Bozhirov. So, how does their insistence that their visits to Salisbury were innocent check out? 
we sent our correspondent Rupert Evelyn to Salisbury to dig deeper into their claims. Before it became the centre of a chemical weapons attack, Salisbury, the leafy city in Wiltshire, was better known for its history and its beauty. It's staggering, really. This building, 1220. This... The nerve agent suspects will have seen some sights, but does it stack up as an alibi? The Russians claim they were in the city to visit the historic cathedral and that it was a stop on the way to see the archaeological site at Old Sarum. But CCTV captured the two men on Wilton Road, a footpath away from the Skripal's house, where the attack took place. If the Russians' motivation was tourism, then this location on the Wilton Road makes no sense. It is not near to any of Salisbury's famous tourist destinations, or any tourist destinations at all. But it does happen to be quite close to where Sergei Skripal lived. They claim they didn't know they were near to the former spy's home when caught on CCTV. But don't explain what they were doing here. I think it's quite insulting to the people of Salisbury and to the casualties that we've had here. Um, the account they've given, of course, isn't credible. Um, it's clearly not true. And on that basis, um, they should be ashamed of themselves. Sergei Skripal was targeted. His daughter, Yulia, caught up in the attack. Dawn Sturgis was the innocent victim killed in a Russian hit, her partner and a police officer fortunate to survive. At the scene of the crime, the cleanup continues with the highest level of protection. The Russians' explanation is wholly implausible to many, but despite that, the suspects maintain they were simply innocent tourists. Rupert Evelyn, News at 10, Salisbury. And our security editor, Rohit Katru, joins me live again now in the studio. So, there's been a lot of mockery about this so-called tourist alibi, but this is, as I tried to make clear at the top, serious matters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been widely reviewed online as if it were a piece of comic theatre, these interviews. Um, this is not a farce, even if it feels like one. This is a tragedy. It's claimed a life. It's um, destroyed many more. Um, the reality is, though, we can draw two things from today's interviews. Firstly, we can make some conclusions about the involvement of the Kremlin, the timetabling around this. 36 hours ago, President Putin said, well, these men should go on television and tell their story, and they did precisely uh, that. Um, and secondly, we can see that they have the support of the Russian state. Uh, these are two men who are wanted by another country who are the subject of an Interpol red notice, and yet they are effectively being harboured um, by the Russians. But frankly, today did not prove or disprove um, anything. Many people will say the story was implausible, but frankly, in terms of what happens next, that really doesn't matter very much. All right. Rohit, thank you. Late this morning, RT, Russia State Broadcasting Corporation, had an exclusive. An interview with the two men the British police have charged in absentia with the attempted murder of Sergei and Yulia Skripal. The two men insisted that they were not, as Theresa May described them, Russian military intelligence agents, but two fitness trainers on a short break, keen to see the historic sites of Salisbury. Don Sturgis died after the Novichok attack and four people were exposed to life-threatening doses of the nerve agent. Following the interview, the Prime Minister's spokesman said that the lies and blatant fabrication in this interview given to a Russian state-sponsored television station are an insult to the public's intelligence. Well, I'm joined now by our diplomatic editor, Mark Urban. Mark, what do you make of all this? Well, a uh, deliberate ploy by President Putin uh, signalled yesterday. He said it was coming, and today we heard from the men themselves. Our friends have been suggesting for a long time that we visit this wonderful town. Salisbury, a wonderful town? Yes. There's the famous Salisbury Cathedral, famous not only in Europe, but in the whole world. It's famous for its 123-metre spire. It is famous for its clock, the one of the first ever created in the world that's still working. Well, uh, apparently virtually verbatim, the Russian wiki uh, words there on the attractions of Salisbury. Look, the, the step that President Putin has taken by this, it, in a sense, concedes a lot of ground. He could have just hidden these people. 
uh, put out all sorts of stories that they might have been Ukrainians, they might have been from anywhere. But he's owned up to having them. Of course, he's disputing that uh, they're the poisoners, but he's owned up to having them. He's owned up to the fact that they're in Russia, despite there being an Interpol red notice mm -hmm. out. You know, in theory, yes, we know Russia doesn't extradite people, but in theory, he should go along with that. And he's shown that he is orchestrating this. We know now, of course, you know, it's confirmed they were in Salisbury, but what else do we actually know now about the picture of their movements? Well, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about this decision to go with this today, uh, they insisted that their names were Petrov and mm -hmm. Bashirov. Uh, I think it's pretty well understood in London that they're not, that those radiuses, they are sticking, as you would say in Russian intelligence, to their legend. Uh, they, all the trips they'd taken in Europe, some of which they talked about today, for example, Switzerland, uh, are, are under this cover, this legend, that they're these sports nutrition guys who are doing business trips. Because I think their view is that if you start to unpick all of those trips, other operations might come into view. Well, so they're trying you, to stick to their story. And you'd already told us that these passports were not forgeries, they were legitimate passports, just with the wrong names on them. Issued by the government. Mark, thank you very much. Well, before we came on air, I spoke from one of our BBC radio studios to Margarita Simoyan on the telephone. She is editor-in-chief of the state-run RT News Channel and the woman who interviewed the men named as Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Boshirov. I began by asking her how she'd found them for the interview. I didn't. They, they called me. Uh, you might have seen that Putin, the president of Russia, that very morning, he had a press conference some, somewhere at some forum, and uh, he was asked a question about them. And he said something like, we know who these people are, we checked them, there's nothing criminal there, and if I were them, I would have called some media organization and uh, came out to the light. But it's not, I mean, it's not literally, but he said something of the kind. And, and that obviously encouraged them to do that. Then they thought that was exactly. the thing to do. Okay. Exactly. That's what they told me. They told me that they heard Putin saying that, and they decided that they were going to reach us out. And obviously they know Russia Today and RT, and they know me, because in Russia I am quite a... Well, quite a media person. I'm always in, on TV and everywhere, and people know me. Right. Well, in this terrible Novichok attack, Don Sturgis died as a result of the attack, and four people were seriously ill in comas for a long time. And the Prime Minister, Theresa May's spokesman today, said, the lies and blatant fabrications in this interview given to a Russian state-sponsored TV station are an insult to the public's intelligence. What's your response to that? Well, unfortunately, we have had quite a history of uh, foreign leaders and especially foreign secret services lying to the whole world. If you just remember Iraq war, that tells us a lot. So that taught us not to believe Theresa May or special services of any kind, unfortunately. Having said that, I don't have any reasons to believe these people either, but I have even less reasons to believe uh, British secret services. But did you put to them the police's uh, assertion that there was Novichok found, traces of Novichok found in their hotel bedroom? I asked them did, if they had Novichok on them or any other poison on them or any uh, at least uh, a bottle of perfume that the British police are saying that they had. And they said, no, that's a lie. Now, when they were in uh, Salisbury, they said to you that they wanted to see the cathedral, they wanted to look at the historic town, and they said that they had pictures of uh, Salisbury Cathedral. Did they show you their pictures of Salisbury Cathedral? No, and uh, we uh, had a conversation before the interview, and they said that they uh, had several conditions on which they were ready to give that interview. And one of the condition, conditions was uh, that no questions would be asked that would allow the media to track their acquaintances or their business partners or their relatives or their classmates or whomever. I don't quite understand how it would involve their relatives or their friends or their business colleagues if they actually showed you the pictures of Salisbury Cathedral, presumably dated, that they claim to have taken. They actually, they actually told me that if they found those pictures, they would uh, uh, send it to me through WhatsApp to a uh, messenger. So I'm still waiting. <laughs> they yes. didn't have them on them. Now tell me, as a journalist, uh, did you believe their story? As a journalist, 
And having worked as a reporter for almost 20 years now, I only believe, oh, for more than 20 years now, I only believe what I see with my own eyes. I saw with my own eyes that they do look completely like the people on the video that was released by the British police. So for that matter, I do believe they are those people. But uh, as far as the story goes, I don't have any reasons to believe them. I don't know them. I haven't spent life with them. They're not my friends. But I have uh, no more reasons to believe secret services who have been lying previously. Um, but I wonder now that you've had this interview, what you're doing to pursue the story. Are you still in touch with them? Uh, they said they would send you um, um, evidence that they actually were at Salisbury I tried, Cathedral. I tried, I tried to call uh, them on the phone from which they called me, and it has been out of coverage ever since. So they said that if they found those pictures, they would send them to me, so I'm waiting. The phone is not responding. Did, did you ask them why, uh, did you ask them if they would come back to the UK and make statements? They, and said, they said that uh, they completely realised that they cannot leave Russia probably for the rest of their lives. But do they not feel that if they came back, they could come back to clear their name? Would that not be something that they should do if they think that they actually could clear their names? I don't think anybody in Russia would believe such a story. Doesn't the manner of this interview you concern you and the fact that it doesn't it just reinforce the idea that RT is a propaganda tool for the Russian state? You did watch the interview, didn't you? Oh, I watched the interview. Did, 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 did you see my face? Did you see the tone? You probably don't speak Russian. I don't speak Russian, but I, I also skeptical. looked at the transcript. Yeah. And the questions were quite obviously hard for them and made them nervous. And at some point, they even uh, said something like, we came here, we thought you would support us and you behave like we were at the uh, investigation in a court. And I said, well, I'm not here to support you. I'm not your advocate. I'm a journalist. I don't know why you would say that. Your question seems completely inobjective to me right now. Your question to me seems like a typical Western propaganda because of which people actually watch RT. And one, just wait, one last point. I, nothing I, like what you're saying it was. Nothing it, like. One Thank last question. One last question. You actually looked at the footage of the, the two men in... Margarita Simeon, are you still there? I think she's gone. Well, our diplomatic editor, Mark Urban, is still here. What do you make of the narrative of that interview with her? Well, uh, you know, it's very uh, familiar in a way, the techniques. Uh, some people call it liquid politics. It's something that has come about in the Putin era where nothing is quite clear, nothing is quite true. Uh, I thought it was rather interesting the way she was talking about, well, I had no particular reason to believe them. I don't know these guys almost like taking this stance of being an objective journalist, whereas, you know, with the best will in the world, she is the editor-in-chief of Russia today. She's known to be an ardent Putin and government supporter. Uh, I don't think she can quite claim journalistic detachment. But, you know, in the end, the facts are meant to speak for themselves, that bad things happened to a traitor mm -hmm. uh, and his daughter and, you know, some other people in the UK, that the people accused of doing it are back in Russia and they're safe and they'll be looked after. But what is the off-ramp for President Putin in this? Well, I think uh, you, you could have assumed, or people who may have been uh, responsible for planning this might have assumed, well, this will be like some of these things that happened in Ukraine. There'll be a bit of a hue and cry. Maybe some dip diplomats will be expelled, but it'll all blow over. It's a tricky calculation, that. I think probably uh, they wouldn't want these people to be making regular appearances. They might hope that they can turn the page with this. Certainly that's what the men themselves were saying, that they hope now to fade into the background. But that's not going to be quite so straightforward. More American sanctions probably on the way in mm -hmm. mid-November uh, because of this uh, Salisbury attack and potentially now more action from the British too. Mark, thanks very much indeed. I've been